This is actually going to be a rough video for me because as many of my older subscribers know, and by older I mean who've been subscribed to me longer, know that I was a Muslim and that, you know, Ahmed Didat was actually one of my heroes. But now I realize that he's just like the rest of them, spewing hate and dogma without even knowing it. Anyway, let's get to the video. He also quoted a Quranic verse like Rafidim, which means there is no compulsion in religion. Compulsion is worthless. At the point of the gun or the knife, you force somebody to say, read the Shahada, the Kalima, the creed of Islam, and the man is forced to read. What is it worth? Nothing. No compulsion in religion, eh? You know, that's a favorite verse for Muslims to quote. Now, if we actually read the verses around Surah 2, Ayah, 256 and thus put it into its proper context, we can see that it does not say what Dida is implying that it says. According to Webster's Dictionary, to compel is to cause, to do, or occur by overwhelming pressure. So let us look at this verse in its proper context and not just the snippet that the dogma propagators like to spew. Let there be no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Whoever rejects evil and believes in God hath grasped the most trustworthy hand hold that never breaks. And God heareth and knoweth all things. God is a protector of those who have faith. From the depths of the darkness he will lead them forth into the light. Of those who reject faith, the patrons are the evil ones. From the light they will be led, then forth into the depths of darkness. They will be companions of the fire, to dwell therein forever. So, once we look at the verse in context, we see a substantially different message than before, don't we? Damnations of disbelievers is quite a common theme in the Quran, actually. In fact, there are over 250 separate damnations of disbelievers throughout the Quran. A good example is Surah 18, Ayah 29, which reads, Say, the truth is from your Lord. Let him who will believe, and let him who will reject it. For the wrongdoers have prepared a fire whose smoke and flames, like the walls of a roof of a tent, will hem them in. If they implore relief, they will be granted water like melted brass that will scald their faces. How dreadful to drink. How uncomfortable a couch to recline on. Now, remember, the definition of compulsion is to compel, which is to cause to do or occur by overwhelming pressure. So, the policy of Allah as told to us through the Quran is, you better accept Islam or else. So, is there compulsion in Islam? I think so. In Egypt, the Muslims have been the overlord of that country for 1,400 years. For a few years, the French came. For a few years, the British came. But overall, for 1,400 years, the Muslim has been ruling that land. And yet, and yet, today, you can boast there are 10 million Coptic Christians in Egypt. If there was compulsion of any kind, there would not have been a single Christian left in the country. So, Mr. Didat, you believe that because there's still a Christian minority in Islamic countries, that that means that Islam was not spread by the sword? That's like saying that since there's still a Jewish population in Germany, that that means that Jews never faced hardships there. Let's go into a little history of Islam, shall we? In approximately 16 AD, Muhammad supposedly receives his first revelation from God. In 613, he finally begins to preach, but is largely ignored and or shunned. By 615, he and his followers are being persecuted by the Quraysh, the people of Mecca. In 622, Muhammad moves to Medina with his converts and gains more converts there as well. In 624, Muhammad and his followers begin to raid caravans, in other words, to steal to finance the new Islamic movement. 
In 624, he also receives a revelation from God and the Sakat, which is a tax on the people, becomes mandatory. In 628, Muhammad signs a peace treaty with the Quraysh. In 630, Muhammad conquers Mecca. In 632, he falls ill and dies. Abu Bakr takes over as caliphate and along with his comrade Umar Farouk begins to enforce Islam in Arabia. Later in 634, Abu Bakr dies and Umar Farouk takes over. In 635, Muslims take Damascus. In 636, they take Medin. In 638, Muslims take Jerusalem from the Byzantines, a major victory for the Muslims, and Christians there are forced to sign a treaty in which they agree to pay the Muslims the jizya in exchange for being allowed to stay Christians. In some cases, this tax was higher than the zakat that the Muslims had to pay. By 662, Egypt falls to the Muslims, and all of North Africa has pretty much been taken by the Muslims. And by 711, the Muslims had begun to take Europe with the conquest of Spain. In 713, the Muslims take Multan. And by 716, Constantinople has been invaded by the Muslims, signifying the fall of the Byzantine Empire. Now, it's important to note that Muslims in this instance are not any more violent than any other peoples. I could read the history of the Byzantine Empire, and there'd be just as many, if not more, conquests in it. But to say that Islam is somehow more peaceful is totally ridiculous. Since, especially since Muhammad's initial battles with the Quraysh, the option is given to them was convert to Islam or die. So Islam was never spread by the sword? Yeah, right. I'm starting a new birthday shout-out program on this channel. How this program works is if the birthday is the following month, you send me an email with your screen name and optionally a link to a non-copyrighted photo of either yourself or something that represents you by the end of the month preceding your birthday and then at the end of a stupidity slamming Sunday video I'll read your name and how old you're going to be and tell everyone else to wish you a happy birthday so in other words okay so say your birthday is in January you need to send me an email with your name or the name that you want to represent you, how old you're going to be, and then in January you'll get a shout out from me wishing you a happy birthday and asking everyone else to wish you one as well. Okay, just some minor things. I'm absolved of any legal liabilities that occur as a result of this and also if you have some long screen name or a bunch of numbers in your screen name Please don't be offended if your screen name is mispronounced or shortened. Thank you.